There we go. Yep. There. All right. I think I guess we can we can start now, right? That sounds good. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon to the CMU um, Africa campus uh, colleagues. Uh, welcome to today's uh, our CMU Libraries workshops um, about the are you interested in learning about the impact of your research? So my name is Hao Yun Lan and I'm the engineer librarian at the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And today also along with me are my colleagues, Matt Marsteller, who are also the science and engineer liaison librarian and also Lu Ling Huang, who are the uh, postdoctoral fellow at the CMU Libraries. So next slide, please. So today's objectives of this workshop is the first one is to get you familiar with the common research metrics, uh, such as the age index, the journal uh, impact factors that are very important to measure your research, the researchers scholarly output performance. And then the second objective is to make you aware of some major research metrics tools that are could help you to um, to exactly measure your research performance. And the third goal is to understand the variety of the other identifiers available and how to make them work for you. And we will also give you some examples of this research metric tools and the, uh, the demo of the other identifiers uh, platform. Next slide, please. So, what are some of the common research metrics today? So the first one, the most popular one is probably the age index. So it is an other level metric. And the next one is the impact factor. So that is falling under the journal level. So it is a journal level metric that can measure the performance of the journal. And then we also have some very emerging metrics. So they are all called the alternative metrics that we will also talk about and give you some example about it. Next slide, please. So yeah, so the first one is the age index. So that as I just talked in the previous slide, so that's um, author's level metrics. So what is the age index? So the age index captures the research output based on the total number of the publications and the total number of citations to these to those scholarly works. And it can also provide the others a focused snapshot of their research performance. So some of the databases that could uh, produce and help you find the age index are the Scopus, the Web of Science, and the Google Scholar. And uh, usually, the higher age index values would mean that more scholarly output for the authors. And to manually calculate the age index, you can see this below example. The first thing is to organize the articles in descending orders based on the number of times they have been cited. So as you can see the, below the example in that, in that graph, this is an example of the author's uh, scholarly output and their articles based on the citations in the, in the descending orders. So you can see the number one that the others has um, 33 citation numbers in total for the first article. And the second article, the other has 30 total numbers of citations. So you can see they all fall under the descending orders. So you can see the other has eight papers, has published eight papers total that have been cited 33, 30, 20, 15, seven, six, five, and four times. So you can see uh, under the sixth article and the citation numbers of that is also six. So that's the um, how we calculate the H index is when the actually the citation numbers is at least at the uh, number of the the order of the articles. So you can see this tells us that the author's age index is six. So any questions about how to calculate age index? So if there are no any questions, yeah, next slide, please. Oh, we do have some, Edith has raised a hand. Oh, oh okay, yeah. All right, go ahead. Yes, so, um... Mm -hmm. 
usually the when you check on Google Scholar and the other databases, the H index varies. I think some count whether you've cited your own work. So what is the right way to actually calculate this? Oh yeah, great question. Should you question. count this, the self citations? Yes. So I think different databases might have different uh, values of H index for the same other, and that is because that they uh, their backend their data is actually different. So their some of the databases data sources are coming from different publishers. So they capture different like uh, so for example in the Google Scholar they might um fetch the probably the um, more articles than other uh, like database tools. So I think that's the reason why the age index might different sometimes for different authors because because the database tools uh, fetch the different, they have different database at the back end. Does that make sense, Edith? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, next slide, please. So the next, uh, we are going to talk about the journal level metrics, which is the journal impact factor. So to calculate the journal impact factor, use a two year period to divide the number of the times that the articles in that journal were cited by the number of the articles that were published. So the common database to calculate the journal impact factor is the journal citation reports. So usually a journal with a high impact factor has the articles that are cited more often. So higher means probably the better, the better performance for a journal. And for example, to calculate the 2022 impact factor of the journal. So let's say that uh, the number of the times is 300 that articles published in 2020 and 2021 were cited by the index journals during 2022. And the 50 is the total number of the citable articles published uh, between 2020 and 2021. So then we just took 300 divided by 50 and then we uh, come to six, which is the 2022 impact factor of the journal. So yeah, so basically to calculate journal impact factor, we just took the uh, the year before and also the, uh, the year before that. So it's basically like, for example, in here, to calculate the 2022, we just took the um, number of times of the articles published in the previous two years prior to the 2022. Yeah. So yeah, so that's how you can calculate the journal impact factor. Are there any questions about how to calculate this factor? All right, so if there are no any questions, we can just uh, move on to the next slide, please. So yeah, and also there are also other common important metrics tools here that are probably more intuitive and doesn't require lots of calculations. For example, the number of publications for the authors and also the total number of the citations for the author. And we also have the citations per paper and also the number of the views and the downloads for the paper. So I think that's more straightforward and, that, and that, that's a, a very straight number that you can usually see that in various database metrics platforms. So yes, I think that's my part. And in the next slides, Luling will uh, introduce some alternative metrics and also give some examples about it. Yeah, yes, um, it's your, yeah, mm -hmm. Luling. Yeah. Oh, okay, I, I thought I thought Matt, Matt, is, Matt is doing this. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do this. Um, okay, so the next, um, so we have, when we talk about some um, traditional metrics like citations, citation-based metrics, and then, but if we think about some um, other kinds of impacts that, uh, that a research uh, output can have, then, um, so for example, uh, a research output can be picked up by by blogs, by um, social media, by other kind of uh, mass media, um, or in policy documents. So, 
how do we capture those kind of um, scholarly impacts? So um, this is related to the alternative uh, metrics. There are two main uh, popular metrics here. Uh, first one is uh, autometric. Um, and this is uh, the tool that we we have. Um, we, um, at CMU, we have the um, uh, autometric explorer uh, where um, it is based on the um, elements um, uh, publication list, um, which means that um, the data database behind all metrics uh, provided at CMU has been, uh, the back end of that data has been uh, uh, verified uh, by, by, by uh, individual researchers. Um, and then um, from another um, provider is the uh, uh, PubMax metrics. Um, um, this metrics also shows up in some of the databases at CMU. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here is just a, a quick ex example of the um, how to use um, all metric um, to show some early impacts. Um, this is uh, an article published uh, very recently, and it totally makes sense that uh, it has zero citation so far because it's a very new article. But as you can see, the all metric score here is um, 60, uh, which means that um, it has been picked up by other um, uh, other sources like uh, news outlets, blogs, and social media. So um, if you want to showcase some of your uh, recently published article, uh, uh, all metric is definitely a, a great tool to, to, to measure your early impact. Right, so I think um, next would be Matt. Okay, uh, thanks, Lu Ling and, and Hao Yang. Uh, I guess one of the things that I, I would point out is that these alternative metrics measure the attention that your research is receiving uh, before any citations perhaps even appear. So that's a, that's kind of an interesting way to measure things. And you have the altmetric donut there with the 60 in the middle. The color scheme indicates, you know, there's 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 the, uh, the how much it's getting tweeted, or whether or not it's in in news outlets or in the yellow. It's a you know there's a, a blogger that has picked up on it. So historically, we've had an awful lot of tools spring into being, but but in the early days, we only had one called the Web of Science. Back then, it was the Science Citation Index, and then it had a Humanities Citation Index and a Social Sciences Citation Index. They're all wrapped into one, now now kind of a misnomer, but called the Web of Science. And it just basically tracks a core set of journals that uh, are, are cited by other journals. And it's been a rather restrictive set of data. In other words, it's not any by any means a, a long and thorough list of journals. It's just what that particular publisher, Clarivate, has deemed it to be the top-notch journals. So whether or not we agree with that, that's that's the measure that we have. That's why their H index can sometimes be a little smaller. Uh, we use another tool called Elements that we capture all of these different uh, measures in. And you'll always notice that that by comparison, the Web of Science uh, H index is much smaller. The, the other thing that comes into play is a researcher has to actually maintain the researcher ID within Web of Science for it to show up in, in our um, elements tool, which is our like a, a research information manager that I guess, uh, Edith, I noticed that you seem to be working with it quite a bit already, which is a great sign. Uh, Scopus came on the scene, oh, maybe about 40 years after <laughs> Web of Science came into being. Uh, and it's uh, quite the rival. It's a little more inclusive than Web of Science. So the H index often shows up as higher. Uh, it's still not comprehensive for journal, book, or conference literature. It's, it's 
markedly better for conference literature. I'll give it that much. Uh, book literature, I think both Web of Science and Scopus are struggling with. Yet a third tool came on the scene about eight to 10 years ago called Dimensions. Uh, it's larger than either Web of Science or Scopus. Again, just a rival product. It's still not comprehensive, uh, but it, it does pretty darn well with journal literature. I'll give it that much. It, it doesn't seem to touch book or conference literature at all at this point which is a big drawback for it that they need to, to try to repair if they can. In contrast, we have Google Scholar. It's, it's probably the most comprehensive, uh, especially according to a recent study, it covers the global South literature a little better, uh, quite a bit better actually, but it doesn't play well with others. So its utility is limited. Uh, Dimensions, Scopus and Web of Science often work with other analytical tools that we also have at Carnegie Mellon that I'll introduce. And uh, that makes them a little more useful. Uh, if you're in a field like librarians or computer science uh, or computer engineering, Google Scholar is probably our best database. So what do we do? Well, we can at least get measures for ourselves in, in uh, like little add-on tools that use the Google Scholar data there's one called Publish or Perish that you, you can get some pretty interesting um, research metrics out of it. It's freely available. You can download it. So I thought that I would uh, uh, pick on our poor uh, university president, Farnam Jahanian, to go through these author identifiers that exist. And so in this case, I'm going through each of these databases and hopefully I'll tie it all together rather nicely for you. So in this case, you'll note that this is an algorithmically generated author record. So Farnham has not really claimed this record. He isn't uh, maintaining it in any way. So it has a researcher ID that we could actually use in our, uh, in our uh, research information management tool that I'll introduce here in a little bit. Uh, but since it's not curated, uh, we can see that it has just 56 total documents there. Now that can be a source of a problem for, for Farnham's uh, 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 H index in the web of science is probably somewhat lower, okay? If you were to claim it and then make sure it was more complete, you'd probably get a higher number. Here he is showing up in the Scopus database. This is also uh, algorithmically generated, but usually uh, with a bigger database, a little more thorough. We see 99 documents in here. And we see a little more interplay with the data and some visualizations that might be helpful. So uh, this is a good example of uh, uh, what you can do, you know, there, there's a, like a beta there for awarded grants. It tracks uh, patents, conference literature, journal literature. Very important for a computer engineer like Farnham. And you can see as a university president, as his administrative duties increased, his uh, publications have, have dropped off a bit. I think we'll, we'll give him a break. He's got a lot to do, right? He also shows up in Dimensions, which is kind of the, the new kid on the block. Uh, now, Dimensions prepare, prepares a, uh, an author profile for, profile for all of us. And uh, so we he, see here he, he's been tracked with 94 publications. We, this display is a little more informative. Uh, we can see the number of grants, the dollar amount, now how accurate that is. We're still kind of out to lunch on. We were hoping it's uh, fairly accurate, but we also have Sparks data, you know, our own internal uh, grant data tracker that that we can use to uh, measure the same thing with grants. Patents is yet another thing that that is tracked. Uh, it'll also track clinical trials if you happen to be in the uh, medical research area. We can see that we now we're up to three different profiles that possibly could be out there, all of them having um, um, identifiers associated with them, author identifiers. 
Okay. Matter of fact, if I were to go back, here is the author identifier in Scopus. That's a Scopus author ID number. Web of Science has their researcher ID. Okay. Dimensions also has a dimensions ID number. I don't have it on the screen here. Usually it's the number at the top of the URL, you know, at the very end of the URL. And uh, it's tracked very readily in, in elements, which is produced by the same umbrella of companies. So your dimensions ID number is yet another way that you could be identified. Okay. So when I went into Google Scholar, the, the thing that we need to realize there is when you have a profile in Google Scholar, it's because you made it. And so Farnham never got around to producing a Google Scholar profile. Or and sometimes uh, a busy guy like him, somebody will go in and, and create it for him and then let him adopt it. But that just simply hasn't been done. He does have literature in there. So, you know, this is something that that um, he could undertake, of course. And here, see, it has a supposedly found 214 results. Uh, we can only hope that that's a, a true, accurate number. Uh, Google Scholar tends to index an awful lot of things that I think none of us would consider a scholarly article. So that's why their data can be somewhat larger as far as number of publications are concerned. And arguably, some folks feel that some of their citations are not uh, what they would consider, oh, legitimate. Okay. So. The other thing is we've got this wonderful reporting tool that works with one of our sources of information. Um, the Scopus data can be pulled in to a tool called SciVal. And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out a few slides ago, let me back up a second. You'll see here in the Scopus author profile for Farnham that we could take this and export it to SciVal. So this data can be visualized in a very cool analytical tool called SciVal. So that's what that export function does. And that's how these two interplay. Uh, SciVal is something that we can use to analyze literature at many levels. It could be the individual researcher, um, a research unit that they want to compose. You know, maybe it's a research area in a department. It could be the whole department, the college. It could be a university, and you could have multiple researchers or units or departments that you want to compare. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, interesting tool. Now, here is SciVal, just one of the, the uh, modules that are available. This is just simply the overview, looking at Carnegie Mellon as a university in its uh, entirety. And all the measures that are here are what they we, we consider uh, fairly influential metrics. They're, they're often part of what's called the uh, snowball metrics. In other words, they've been vetted by a group of experts and, and indicated that, yeah, these are, are a good way to measure things. So one thing is that there is this measurement called the field-weighted citation in impact. And this impact measurement is good when you want to compare apples to apples. So people uh, or usually um, entities at a very granular level, it's very good to measure like uh, how a university might compare to another university uh, in a particular sub-discipline like astrophysics or uh, a certain aspect of computer science or computer engineering, okay? And so in the overview, you can just look at one item at a time. You can see it has a benchmarking module that you can use to benchmark multiple entities all at the same time. So if you were wanting to uh, compare yourself to other researchers that you've tracked, there, this is an example that I set up for Ben Hunt for him to compare himself to other researchers that are similar to him. And where does he fit? And you'll see that I arranged this report in uh, SciVal for, to track the citation count overall, citations per publication, the H index. We could have added the field-weighted citation index. 
It's, it's got the scholarly output. So we can see that that can be a, a fairly uh, uh, interesting little benchmarking tool. And one of the things that you can do with SciVal is use that to tell your story better. Uh, maybe you need to do to uh, apply for a grant and you want to, to indicate what your uh, most impactful research has been. And uh, you probably have a good idea why it's been so impactful. Some of these tools are great at bubbling out the things that have been cited the most or by comparison have really helped your measures uh, you know, against your colleagues. Okay. Yet another thing is the, the ORCID ID is another identifier that can be used. And uh, people look to it as something that we that kind of uh, sews everything together. And uh, let's see, I think we're we're down to to Edith and our audience. And so Edith, you're 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 actually a shining example of somebody that has come to the university and a lot of your stuff is is set up already. And including your ORCID ID. And you've also you've obviously connected it to Carnegie Mellon. And you've gone into your elements uh, profile and you set up your ORCID uh, ID, which is all great to see. Uh, we're trying to encourage other people to do the same. Okay. Now, I mentioned elements, but elements is what's called a research information management tool that each of us can use to manage our uh, uh publications and other things that we've got going on, things like grants data, uh, uh, um, activities that we've undertaken, what we've taught. And uh, so it's a very interesting tool. And you can see that it drags in data from Scopus, Dimensions, Web of Science. And this is a, a perfect example of a computer engineer or computer scientist. You can see they've got a fairly high number in Scopus. Dimensions is not so high because remember, it tends to ignore that conference literature, which is really important for a computer engineer or computer scientist. And it looks like they may not be maintaining their um, web of science uh, uh, researcher ID. Okay. By comparison, this is the data that I pulled from Google Scholar. And we can see that the H index is higher. The overall number of publications is higher. Uh, yeah, so it's the H index is dependent on the data being used. That's the big uh, the big lesson to learn there. Now, Scholars is a tool that takes our our information out of Elements and presents it to the public, and uh, we love to see uh, the faculty adopting this. So again, thank you, Edith, uh, and eventually. What will go on, you can see that it's slowly growing across the campus, and we're trying to encourage the, um, the faculty from around the campus or from around the university to go ahead and, and uh, make their profile public. The example here, now we're back in Elements, but you'll notice that we can look at his, Curtis Meyer's public profile. Now, we always... Uh, tend to showcase Curtis because he's used it so extensively. Well, in this case, we've uh, been very careful with this publications list. That's sometimes uh, a researcher will get into trouble because they get confused with another researcher. In this case, I actually had to go back and repair Curtis's publications list because they kept confusing him with another high energy physics researcher at the Large Hadron Collider, whose initials were C.A. Meyer. You know, so sometimes you can get confused. And in this case, the Scopus database had the two of them confused. So I had to go in and, and separate the two authors basically by hand, uh, the special request of the folks at Scopus. Yeah. The grants data is pulled in automatically from our Sparks database. So if you go for research funding, it will be tracked there. Uh, teaching activities come from S3. So that's going to be a little bit out of date because they have to wait for the semester to end, basically, before they add the, the teaching activities. Okay. And then professional activities is the some one thing that we have to add in by hand. But you can see... Uh, 
Curtis actually did this all by himself. As part of our service to the university, though, we do have some people, we've hired some students that will do this. They'll take your CV, you can hand off your current CV, and the students will just enter the data for you. Uh, it's it's rather tedious. Uh, I know I put in nearly 100 professional activities because I'm kind of old, <laughs> so it was a lot to add. And uh, it's very tedious to do on your own. But if you want to, you can certainly do so. So if we were to look at Curtis's profile, and also from what we can see here, Curtis has also linked up his ORCID ID. And um, he can edit his profile rather readily. And so we can view his public profile. You'll notice right now, I'm actually doing a function called impersonating Curtis. If you ever need help from a librarian, we can go into elements and take a look at the problem by impersonating you. And then and we can uh, either change the data for you or, or do what we can on our end to help you out if you're if something ever goes wrong. OK, I'll keep that in mind. And so from his public profile, we can see that Curtis has, has built out quite a uh, 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 a public profile, including you can add media. So this is important if if you want to start attracting graduate students, you might have some uh, maybe even professionally done uh, video where you're talking about your research, and it might be a great way to introduce yourself to prospective graduate students that you might work with or collaborators. And that way they get a view of you and you know what it is that you do. So you can easily import uh, media there. Yes, Ida. Yeah, so you actually raised a, a point that I've been wondering about the scholars website. So who is the intended audience for this? And are you anticipating that um, CMU researchers should use this profile as their main one, like uh, instead of an ORCID ID on their CV, for example? Uh, what we hope to see it become, and we've got nearly 500 faculty members on it, so I guess we're closing on an, on, in on the 50% mark, is we would like to see uh, journalists, um, funders, um, ourselves. This is a, a public-facing, um, interesting look at the research at Carnegie Mellon. So... Uh, it, it doesn't really replace anything, but oftentimes like the biographical sketch that you stick in there uh, is something that you can cut and paste from another page. Like Curtis has this professional homepage linked. He's got his Google Scholar page linked. There's a department website for him that's there as well, all tied together for people. Uh, and there also, as you as your time at Carnegie Mellon lengthens, and maybe you start working with other faculty on campus, your collaboration network would build. That's an internal collaboration network of who is this faculty member been working at, working with at Carnegie Mellon, wherever it may be. And that's just a very interesting look at how the outside world can view us, but we can also use it as well. So we do things like uh, the the sustainable development goals are, are tagged to our records as well. It's just a, an interesting way to explore us. And if we were to take a look at all of these things, other than your professional activities, these are automatically generated. So it's not something that you really need to pay super duper close attention to. You'll get a pretty good result just from setting it up initially and letting it run. So it's probably going to be your your freshest uh, public presence, we hope. So we're doing this as just a way to help you out. Thank you. That clarifies it. Sure. Now here's an example of that collaboration network. Um, so here we have, uh, this is his extended network. So what that means is we show Curtis and Reinhard Schumacher and John Allison, uh, the number of publications associated with them while working at Carnegie Mellon and or or while working period, and we can see uh, Curtis is the the 
more established researcher. Reinhardt's been a while around for a while. John is in high energy physics research, so he publishes like a couple articles a week, it seems like. Uh, but he's one of five thousand people, <laughs> but only a couple, you know, only only Curtis here at the uh at the um university level. He has other other uh collaborators at Carnegie Mellon, but if we were to click on his little circle there, we would see that. Okay. But John also works with one of our computer scientists. So we can see that Curtis's extended network includes that. So as people take a look at each other's networks, they might see, oh, why are they working together? And they can explore that. And maybe I should work with that person too when I have a, something, my work might delve into their research area. Well, that's kind of the things that we're hoping to do, make connections around campus and to let the public do the same thing. So that's uh, all that we wanted to make sure that we covered. And uh, if we wanted, we could always, uh, uh, let me see here, let me escape. We can always go into some of the tools and explore a little bit. We're at 941. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes. If you've got something that we should explore, um, uh, let's see here. I guess, uh, um, Edith, I think one of the things that I noticed for you is that you might want to uh, take a look at, at the, the uh, algorithmically generated uh, researcher ID and claim it and make it as complete as possible. You're going to find that that smaller Web of Science database might not pick up all your research, but uh, as you uh, work with it and then make sure that it's being tracked by uh, elements, you might see that the the somewhat lower uh, um, elements H index might grow a little bit. Uh, so sometimes it's just good to, to keep track of that researcher ID. You can sync it up with your uh, ORCID ID, and and hopefully these things continually feed one another. Um, let's see. I didn't notice whether or not your I think your your orchid is connected to your to your elements profile now, right? I think you've done that. Uh, yes, I set it up, but I think I still needed to import a couple of things, so I only did some. I haven't finished syncing up everything else. Okay, and the thing you can either have elements feed orchid or the other direction, but not both, and uh, so it all depends on. I, I've been letting elements feed ORCID uh, because there are certain things like uh, maybe I go to a conference and present a poster or do a just a, a presentation. And I when I'm back from the conference, I'll put that into Kilt Hub uh, and then it gets tracked automatically in elements and which then automatically feeds it to ORCID. So just... <laughs> so could you actually, if you have... Um, time, could you run through how you set it up that way? I feel like it might be easier. Sure. Uh, so let me go into, I'll go into elements. Okay, so here is my homepage and so you can ignore all these actions that I need to do. Uh, but let's see here. I have my ORCID settings. And so I am. I can change this here if I wanted to, and then at the bottom I could run the sync or, or save my changes and then run the sync. Uh, or uh, so what I, I've set it up to do is read from and write publication data from Elements to my Orchid account. That's all. And uh, so one of the things, one of the sources of information for Elements is called Kiltub which is, uh, I don't know, have you uh, used Kilt Hub yet? No, I'm just hearing about it right now. Okay. Um, if I were to look in our services, under K, and I hope it's there. Yep, there it is. We provide this as a way to store 
pretty much anything. And if you have a, a written an article and it's in a subscription only journal, but they do allow you to post uh, an open access version of it, like the uh, the the approved draft that that they're going to work from, and and then they're going to put it into their own formatting. You can actually post it into Kilt Hub, provided that's okay with the publisher. And uh, uh, other things, if you have data sets, if you have research data sets and you don't have anywhere else to store them and they're of uh, you know, a fairly reasonable size, you can store them in Kilt Hub and share them with the world if you wish. It'll give them a DOI, uh, which is often something that uh, is very important to people. And so just as an example, if I could spell my own name, which I couldn't, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so you see I've got 20 different things there from posters to a presentation slides to... Um, I don't have a data set to show you, but uh, some things are, are the full-blown paper. So it's a lot of things that you can stick in there, but this actually serves as one of the data feeds for your publications in Elements. So if I were to look at my publications and you could see the different types. So there's a presentation. It's the most recent thing I had there, a presentation at the ASWE conference, uh, American Society for Engineering Education. So that's just one thing that actually shows up now in my ORCID profile as well. So that's how that's uh, dealt, dealt with. So again, that was just the, the menu, your ORCID settings, and then you choose what you want to do. And you can change it. Okay? Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, let's see, uh, other things that I could, uh, hmm. how you would appear in both, uh, Scopus and SciVal. So let me go to the Scopus database. And I can search by author. Yeah, what was it? Yeah. And yeah, so I, I was curious who the attendees would be. So I've, I've looked for you recently. We see one author result there. So here's one where your recent affiliation uh, I was a little confused by the Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology, but I should I probably know. ask about this. So yeah. I th I think um, so that was my previous institution, and one of the challenges I faced with both Orchid ID and all these profiles is how to switch affiliation. I think Google Scholar is the only one that just allows you to verify with your email. Yeah, yeah, that's a challenge, and uh, so you. At this point, you can edit your profile. This is where I said, "Oh, this is this is this is our Edith. Yeah, this is the right person." And uh, so, if you want, you can edit your profile, and you might be able, I think, to change your current affiliation. I see, but it has to be each individual profile, even though they're linked together. It doesn't just blanket change everything. Yes, if you try to edit that. And it doesn't work the way that you quite want. Uh, just let me know, and we'll get in contact with the folks at Scopus and get that working. What will happen is, as you publish again with Carnegie Mellon, you will show up as a Carnegie Mellon. Uh, they'll probably switch that automatically, but it'll take a little time. Oh, I see. Okay, I think this one was switched automatically. I never did anything. Yeah, that's very likely. Okay. And uh, so know that you can actually edit your profile if you want. Okay. We can also export you into SciVal, which is kind of cool. 
So here's your overview in SciVal. You'll notice that this number is a little bit different. It's because we're restricted in 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 what years are there. So you, I think you have some earlier literature that's not there. And uh, so it's only looking at the last, yeah, whatever that is, five years. Okay. It's all subject areas. And uh, so you're able to see at a glance, uh, you know, what subject areas you're working in. So this is a good thing for somebody like um, um, Hal Young, who's your liaison librarian. You can quickly see, oh, what areas does she work in? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty uh, useful. Um, you know, there maybe there are uh, people that you might want to benchmark against, like maybe that Tim Brown guy, right? <laughs> uh Although that might not be a fair comparison because he's been... Yeah, yeah, a bit of an unfair comparison, but yeah. <laughs> he's a little longer in the tooth, right? <laughs> not a fair comparison, but maybe somebody that works in the same research area as you might make an interesting uh, group to uh, benchmark with. So here, you can see here that um, this was the Ben Hunt uh, exercise that I had going. And we're looking at things like scholarly output per publication year. Uh, you can change the y-axis to maybe some kind of a citation measure. Let's look at field-weighted citation impact. That What that do, does is um, takes a look at um, how well your individual articles are doing and maybe just look at the last five years there. Let's switch that to 2017. Here, little fewer data points. And so we see Ben is is doing pretty well. Now, when you're dealing with individuals like that, I picked a bad measurement. The field weighted citation impact can flop around quite a bit. You can have a one hit wonder that that really skews your data and give you a really high field weighted citation index. It's typically only used when you want to compare entities or measure an entity that has at least 50 documents in the set of data that you're, you're analyzing. Uh, otherwise, one well-cited paper would make your, your field-weighted citation index uh, impact soar on you. So that's one thing to consider. So I chose a bad measure. <laughs> so is there a way to see what, um, I guess, your peer group, where your peer group is publishing? Um, you, you showed me the visualization of what subject areas I'm publishing in, is there a way to see how you compare to people based on that, for example? Yes, and I think that's one of the most powerful things that you can do is if, so we're we're taking a look at, uh, who has published what uh, and, and how much. So maybe Ben, looking to, to somebody like uh, Ken Fai Mock, who I think is more of a comparator that he is, is trying to reach. He realizes he's not there yet. He's maybe, I think this fellow is more experienced. He can take a quick look and say, all right, where is this guy publishing? Okay. What research thrusts is he working in? Are they different than mine? Does that explain maybe some of his research is, is in areas that are more prominent than my own? That happens a lot. Um, were to analyze him in more detail, we can see where he has published. Now I'm trying to find that. Uh... Yeah, here we are. So yes, you can take a look by scope of source, and these are the journal titles where that person is publishing. So if you wanted to compare yourself with somebody and you're in SciVal and you you look them up, you can easily see, this is simply the overview and published by Scopus source. And you can see what sources they're tracking for that person and then see where they're publishing. And maybe it's a little different than yours. And maybe they're publishing in a journal that you hadn't thought about publishing in. So it can be very, very powerful. Um, uh, so it's uh, kind of a fun thing to do. And because uh, the, one of the benefits for your work is that you have, uh, okay, and so Eric has joined us. So thank you, Eric. Uh, 
is uh, one of the things that you can do is work very hard on your elements profile like you have done, Edith, and that way your alt metrics or your attention that your publications are getting are showing up almost immediately, sometimes within weeks of publication. And uh, so that can help you tell a, an interesting story about your work. You know, uh, maybe I can envision maybe some of your work actually might be cited by a policy document. And that might be something down the road that you want to discuss in a grant application, something like that, saying it's my work has drawn the attention of policymakers out there and uh, here's why. And, and these tools help you to discover that. So that's something that you might discover in Altmetric Explorer when you look at yourself there. Um, other things are, uh, you know, this would m help you easily uh, to uh, to figure out um, if we were to go back to overview and we can probably find you now uh, under L, right? You could quickly um, ah, yeah, there. Maybe you want to see what are the most uh, cited articles that you've got. Okay, and let me see. And this probably isn't the best tool for that. Uh, so many different resources here. We could, in Scopus, you can quickly see what, what are the most cited papers that you've got. And that can help you to tell your story a little bit better. So it all depends on what tool you're in and uh, and uh, trying to figure out what could help you tell a better story about your research. So keep that in mind as you're you're trying to put together your like a reappointment or promotion case in the future. And to know that you can reach out to your liaison librarian or to our research metrics team, uh, which uh, Lu Ling and Hao Yang, myself and Jimmy McKee are on, and know that we're we're here for you to. If you want to tell a particular story about your research impact uh, and you want to use things like Altmetric or Scopus or SciVal or Dimensions, we can certainly, since we use them a little more frequently, we can help you to sift through the data to find it, you know, find the best uh, data to support what it is that you want to say. So, and, and you might find that you love these tools. I, I, I think in your background, you do an awful lot of uh, mashing of data. So you might love these things and you'll be in them a lot. So might wind up being better than we are, right? <laughs> you, you would think, but yeah, there's quite a quite a lot of tools and this has been informative. So I've used a couple. Um, I've learned a lot about the features in some of them. I usually just go for the first page and I don't dig deeper. So this has been very helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. And if you ever have any questions about them, uh, please let us know. Uh, I, I think we hit most of the ones that, especially the ones that we pay a lot of money for. So I, I tell people, you know, please use them as much as you want. <laughs> Try to wear out the electrons uh, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are certainly tools for you. Um, if you find them particularly helpful, you know, tell some of your colleagues about them. If they have questions, they can talk to us. If you ever have any trouble using things like uh, Elements or Kilt Hub or, or dealing with your um, author identifiers, just let us know and we'll try to help you out. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Sure. And um, let's see, uh, Eric, do you happen to have any questions at all? I'm not sure when that you got into the, into the uh, presentation. Well, sorry, I I joined real late, uh, like um, ten minutes ago. So no, no questions. I think maybe the only question I can ask if um, 
uh, you have prepared some slides so that maybe you can share them and um, I'll go through them and if I have questions I can uh, uh, communicate back via email. Oh sure and I think we can do you one better since so we've got uh, this being recorded. Oh so, great. So you can go back and, and watch the recording and, and if you have mm -hmm. any questions feel free to reach out to us. Great thank you. And I was I was so thrilled that, that you were able to join us today. Uh, you know uh, uh, Sarah Young and and how Young had encouraged us. Let's do this at nine a.m. so that people from from CMU Africa could join us. So uh, we're so so pleased that you're here. Mm -hmm. And I'm so that I so in the end I joined late. So I had a meeting with my students and uh, it took uh, more than planned. So. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes. We understand. Uh, meetings with students come first. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, again, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I know especially uh, uh, how young would be really thrilled and Sarah. And uh, so we know that we're here for you and we're only a, a connection away. So uh, lots of things that the libraries can be providing. And one of the things I think that we tried here was our uh, services page. Mm -hmm. And so know that if you want to explore what services we've got, we've got a services directory. Mm -hmm. Does that might uh, be of interest to you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, well, if you're ever in Pittsburgh, please stop in, say hello. Uh, and Will do. I, I know that, that Sarah has visited uh, the CMU Africa campus once, but she couldn't get in. <laughs> but we have to plan ahead if we ever visit so that we could get in to see you. <laughs> so everybody take care and I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And I guess when I end this, uh, the recording will be set and I'll make sure that that I think is does that automatically go out to people then or do I have to send it? Yeah, probably need you need to like, um, yeah, send it. Yes, it doesn't have it automatically. Yeah. OK, I can mm -hmm. do that. No problem. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. thanks again, everybody. Everybody take care. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, take have care. a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.